Today on Government Matters, the Defense Department has an agency focused on finding, identifying, and recovering the remains of thousands of missing service members, going all the way back to World War II. And Russia's nuclear forces conduct practice launches intended to simulate a retaliatory strike. President Putin has said that he's ready to use, quote, all means available to defend against any attack on Russian territory. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the show that delivers insights on federal government programs, people, and operations. I'm Mimi Gerges. The Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency's mission is to find and recover American service members who were taken prisoner of war or were missing in action in past conflicts. Kelly McKegg is the director of the agency. Kelly, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mimi. It's a privilege to be on your program. So your efforts go all the way back to World War II. How many service members are you searching for? Surprisingly, they're close to 82,000 that are missing from World War II through Operation Iraqi Freedom. Of that, we estimate 38,000 to be recoverable, the remainder being deep water at sea losses. And how many have been uh, recovered so far this year? Last year, last fiscal year, we identified 166, predominantly from World War II, 134, but also 30 from Korean War, as well as two from Vietnam. So let's talk about that process. Let's go through the steps. What's the first step in the process of searching for remains? It always begins with research. Our historians, our analysts, our intel specialists all dive through wartime records, field activity records, as well as archives to build that piece that might be able to take an area this size, reduce it to that. At that point, we will send a field investigation team to search for clues, and if successful, to get it down to here, we will send an archaeologist or anthropologist-led team with which to excavate and recover what we hope to be remains. And what are some of the tools that you have to narrow down that, that search? It's incredible from the standpoint that our historians and researchers pour through volumes of records to, again, narrow the field that we look for. And then we have the most talented anthropologists and archaeologists that can take modern techniques and literally scour a field up to sometimes six meters deep in order to find the remains of, say, a crash site. And, you know, you talked about doing research to find a probable site. What research is out? Is this public information? Do you do interviews with people? Is it history? What do you do? It's all of that. Uh, primarily going through archival records, uh, unit histories, wartime battlefield records, as well as interviewing witnesses. Now, obviously, in World War II, these are secondhand witnesses oftentimes. But in the case of Vietnam, it's often firsthand witnesses. But again, they're aging, they're dying, so time is against us. You're also developing new ways to identify remains, including chest x-rays. It's absolutely incredible. We have two forensic laboratories, the most predominant skeletal human skeletal labs in the world. Uh, they utilize a number of techniques. We use seven lines of evidence to identify an American. It begins with anthropological analysis, their bones. You relate, you, you mention chest x-rays. I never knew this. Your collarbone, your clavicle, is as unique as a fingerprint. So if our scientists are able to recover a clavicle from the field and we have the individual's chest x-ray from when they entered the service, they can do a match that literally prioritizes that clavicle against 60,000 x-rays to find that match. We also use dental remains if we find them. Again, comparing them against dental records from World War II, Korean War, or Vietnam. The most promising and most technologically advanced method of identification is DNA. And if we are able to have a family member's DNA on file, we can match that DNA using three DNA types, mitochondrial, nuclear, as well as autosomal. Our partner at the Armed Forces Medical Examiner Service at uh, Dover Air Force Base is incredible they are able to take degraded DNA that has been doused with formaldehyde to preserve the remains back during the war. It's been proven that that extraction technique is harder to get DNA from than 30,000-year-old Neanderthal remains. Mm. Absolutely incredible. 
You have a lab at Offit, Offit Air Force Base. What's there? What's going on there? So we have two laboratories. The original one is in Honolulu at Joint Book Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Our second laboratory is in Omaha, Nebraska at Offit Air Force Base. The scientists at Offit Air Force Base take care of all the remains that come from Europe, whereas everything from the Indo-Pacific region comes through the laboratory in Honolulu. Both are staffed by incredible odontologists, forensic dentists, anthropologists, archaeologists, as well as material evidence specialists. There are times, I understand, where you could get, um, there could be different service members or other people with those remains. How are you able to um, understand, you know, who's who and to really specify that? One of the most unique techniques that our scientists have come out with and patented by again getting it certified and accredited is what they call isotope testing. What you eat and drink as a young person stays with you for life. So we are able to determine where you might have grown up. And so we're able to differentiate and segregate the remains by an American versus somebody that grew up in Asia or someplace in Europe. The water you drink, the food you eat, marks you literally through these isotopes. And not only that, but we're able to segregate here in the United States regionally by determining, did you grow up in the Midwest? Did you grow up in the Northeast or, or South? And, you know, some missing service members are in anonymous graves. How do you determine when to disinter those, in, um, those remains um, to, to test them and to do all the, the scientific testing that you can do? So 20% of the 38,000 that we estimate to be recoverable are buried as an unknown somewhere in a U.S. controlled cemetery, Europe, here in the United States, or in the Philippines. This is their final resting place shortly after the war. What we, the onus is on us to prove to our superiors at the Pentagon that there's a higher than probability that we can identify should we be able to disinter. So we will put together a very voluminous package that looks at historical background, that looks at forensic records that are on file that says, we think this person, this unknown in this grave might be service member so-and-so. All right, we're going to take a pause here and then we'll continue. On the other side of the break, we'll continue our conversation with Kelly McKegg, director of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. We'll be right back. We're back with Kelly McKegg, director of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. So Kelly, there are also efforts to, under, to recover underwater remains. I would imagine that's a lot more complicated. It is, and right now we are limited to about 200 feet of water. Anything beyond that technology limits us, but we are embarking upon a test with the United States Navy on what they call saturation dive, which allows divers to stay underwater, stay underwater for longer periods of time and that can get us down to a thousand feet. And we're also using underwater robotics, unmanned little robots that can scour a debris field in a record time and allow our scientists to be able to dive in a specific area. You know, in, in a lot of instances, especially when we're talking about the Pacific, the U.S. is working with countries that used to be our enemies. How is that and how did that come about? It really is an incredible story. Uh, ten years after the Viet end of the Vietnam War, the United States and Vietnam entered into the Paris Peace Accords. And from that, we were able to offer to Vietnam that this was important to us. There were still over 2,000 missing from the Vietnam War. And so Vietnam knew, this was ten years before normalization, before President Clinton restored the embassy and diplomatic relations. Ten years after the end of the war, Ten years before normalization, Vietnam started cooperating with the United States. That dates back to 1985. And in that time, over 1,200, almost 1,300 missing service members from Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia have been recovered and identified. It incredibly speaks to the humanitarian nature of this work, that countries use this as a, the United States uses this with countries that we work with as a tool of engagement, a tool of diplomacy, and here Vietnam, in the height of economic sanctions, in the height of 
penalties, trusted the United States to cooperate on this, and they've been doing so for 37 years. You know, your agency is fairly new. It was established in 2015. Um, what were these efforts like before your office was created, and, and why was it created? It was, so DPAA, Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, was formed by Secretary Hagel in 2015. It's an amalgamation of three different organizations. But prior to that, these organizations continued to do the research, the analysis, as well as the recoveries and identification. The history of the program actually dates back shortly after World War II in 1947, when the American Graves Registration Service established this concept, this mission, and this capability. And over time, temporary laboratories were set up in Japan, in Thailand, but today it's a permanent presence that really dates back and I think a lot of credit goes to the family members of Vietnam War MIAs who banded together in a grassroots effort, raised the consciousness of the nation. They designed the black and white iconic POW flag that we're all familiar with. And those mothers, wives, daughters, sons, all raised the consciousness. And from that, we have this very unique and more importantly, cutting edge mission today. And, and I know that this is very personally important to you, this, this type of work. Is there a particular story of a recovery that really resonated with you? We always say, Mimi, that despite the fact that we're looking for 38,000 that we estimate to be recoverable, every single one of those 38,000 is more than a number. Each one has a unique story that dates back and it's intergenerational. Family members know about their loved one. You may be talking to a third second generation family member, and it's as if you're talking to the grandmother. I remember a story, in fact, right here in our backyard, uh, Sergeant Roy, Army Sergeant Roy DeLauder, uh, he was from Smithburg, Maryland, which is near Hagerstown. He was a 21 year old who went off to war right after Korean War hostilities broke out. He was lost in December of 1950. He was one of 13 children. You remember the 55 boxes that were part of the Singapore summit that President Trump and Chairman Kim had negotiated. And these 55 boxes, North Korea turned over to the United States readily. Uh, no conditions. Uh, we ended up delineating 250 individuals. Sergeant Roy DeLauder was actually in two boxes, box 27, box 41. We identify him from those boxes. We repatriate him three sisters, all in their 90s, are still alive. Two daughters, Charlene and Sue, were three and one and a half when their dad went missing. You can only imagine that the town of Smithburg, in fact, all of Hagerstown, came together that Friday afternoon. It would have been Roy's 90th birthday on that day. Absolutely incredible stories. But again, it speaks to our nation. It speaks to the values that we as Americans share. And it's something that, again, transcends. And you personally go to the funerals I when go, they're local. I go to as many as I can in Arlington. Uh, one that I think is worthy of your, your uh, listeners and your viewers hearing about is on September 14th, Lieutenant Colonel Addison Baker was a B-24 pilot. He was older. He was actually a group commander that led the Operation Tidal Wave. It was the largest bombing mission, 177 bombers, went toward the oil fields in Romania to literally take out refineries. Lieutenant Colonel Baker was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for his heroism and valor in the skies. He personally, despite his aircraft being severely damaged, brought that entire armada toward the oil refineries. He was buried, one of the unknowns that you mentioned about, he was buried shortly after the war in a temporary cemetery in Romania. American Graves Registration Service finds him, can't identify him. They bury him in Ardennes National Cemetery, American Cemetery in Belgium. We disinter, we identify him. And you found him. We found him. He was the middle of three children. His niece, two nephews are there. They remember his, their uncle buzzing the home every time he came back to Ohio. Kelly, thanks so much for being on the program. Maybe a priv privilege, and thank you again for all you do and what Government Matters and Defense Matters does.
Up next on Government Matters, the Pentagon looks to get crucial air defense systems to Ukraine as Russians continue attacks against the country's civilians and infrastructure. Stay with us. Russia recently carried out its annual nuclear forces exercises involving multiple practice launches of ballistic and cruise missiles. This comes as Ukraine asks for more air defense systems. Tom Carrico is the director of the Missile Defense Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Tom, welcome to the program. Good morning. So these nuclear exercises are annual. Russia notified the U.S. in advance. Is there anything to be worried about here? Well, uh, they, are, they are a regular occurrence, as you say. Uh, I think it's, uh, as much as anything, a, an effort to uh, just uh, uh, display Russia's capabilities. Uh, the context, uh, we can't, of course, lose the context here, uh, namely the, the nuclear threats, the nuclear kind of saber rattling that uh, Russia has been making about Ukraine and, frankly, some of its other neighbors uh, as they uh, suffer tactical losses uh, in, uh, in Ukraine uh, on the battlefield. So uh, I, I think it's important to put it in context, but, frankly, this is why the United States and NATO has uh, the nuclear posture it does and the nuclear capabilities. Uh, this isn't anything new, in other words, and this is why a conservative uh, posture on, uh, on nuclear deterrence is, why, is, is what we in, the, in NATO have had for, for many years. I want to ask you about those drone attacks um, from the Iranian-made kamikaze drones, and those have been targeting civilians and, and infrastructure. U.S. officials have viewed the wreckage of those drones that were used. What are they trying to learn from that wreckage? Well, it's fascinating. The fact that Russia has turned to Iran, uh, it's, it's this new axis of evil here in the, uh, in the Ukraine conflict, I think really has had the, uh, the, the unexpected consequence of shifting some alliances. And Israel, which has been on the fence for so long in this, in this conflict, uh, seems to be getting involved. Uh, they'd like to be doing some target practice, uh, as well as fundamentally getting some intel on this, uh, this Iranian technology so in case they should, uh, they should face it someday. So a lot of civilians being targeted. Uh, I will say this past week, the Biden administration released not merely its nuclear posture review, but also a new missile defense review. And countering UAVs like this, like they are being used in Ukraine right now, is a uh, really a singular uh, uh, highlight of that review. This is part of air defense. Uh, you see the demand signal in Ukraine for all types of air and missile defense, and that demand signal is going to be here to stay. So what's that going to mean for the strategy? I mean, you said it's, been, it's being highlighted. So what are you recommending to the Pentagon? <laughs> well, uh, the, the, the fact that the strategy recognizes that, that countering UAVs is a fundamental part of air defense is going to have all manner of organizational and acquisition uh, impacts. The U.S. Army is the uh, lead service for this mission, has been for several years now, and they've kind of been winnowing down what are the key capabilities that, uh, that we can get. And really the demand signal here is enormous. Uh, they just can't get enough capability out fast enough. And so, you know, put the Iranian drone and, and all these other kinds of air and missile threats in Ukraine in context, the Ukrainians are, are just, you know, yelling from the rooftops for any air defense they can get. It doesn't have to be, you know, exquisite. It doesn't have to be perfect. They just want more of it. You're going to see a similar, and I would say, sustained uh, demand signal here in the United States. We've seen this coming for years now. Witnessed the 2019 Iranian attacks on Saudi Arabia, for instance, uh, and likewise the the handful of attacks in Iraq and around the Middle East, uh, just uh, on a regular basis. We've seen this coming. It's here, and this is really going to require really the entire joint force. Uh, that has taken air superiority for granted for so many years, they have to now start looking up uh, and worrying about uh, this. That's what we're seeing in Ukraine, and that's going to be uh, coming to a, a theater near you uh, elsewhere as well. Well, let's talk a little bit more about air defense. You know, there have been reports that the U.S. is considering sending Hawk air defense missile systems to Ukraine. Describe that. What benefit would that have to Ukraine, and is that the best system for, mm. for uh, their needs? Well, uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, the, the best shouldn't be the enemy of the good. And the Ukrainians that are really b being put in a situation of picking up a rifle and shooting at these Iranian drones, uh, again, they'll take anything. Um, the United States just, just passed over a, a couple batteries of what's called NASAMs. 
Uh, that's actually a, a capability that defends Washington, D.C. It's a Norwegian-made uh, capability, actually. The Hawk system uh, is a little bit of a, an older thing. And Spain has been uh, actually working to, to, to give some old Hawk systems. It's a predecessor to the Patriot, actually. So it's been around for a while. Uh, now, there are some conflicting reports about what exactly the U.S. is doing on the Hawk side. Uh, but there's, again, everybody is scrounging in the couch cushions, finding anything that will be useful to, uh, to shoot at, to deter, uh, to combat everything from drones to fixed and rotary wing aircraft. Uh, to uh, cruise missiles uh, end up. So no, Hawk is, Hawk is a little bit of a, a museum piece relative to other things, but we've taken air superiority for granted for so many years, and we can't just flip a light switch and come up with uh, lots of this stuff overnight. So it's a little bit of a tragedy. Uh, these are the wages of not having enough air defense for the United States, for Europe. All of Europe is really, I would say, casting about and trying to figure out how do they get more of this stuff and likewise, anybody in the uh, in harm's way uh, in the vicinity of China is asking those same questions. And we're out of time. Tom, thanks so much for being on the program. Thanks very much. If you miss an episode of Government Matters, it's on our website at govmatters.tv. And don't forget, you can find every episode of our program on YouTube. Be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss any of the videos we post. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 10.30 on WJLA 24-7 News and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on 7 News to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the federal government. Thanks for watching. I'm Mimi Gerges.